I'm a 22-year-old woman that serves tables at a pretty popular pub around the tiny city I live in, thanks to my job I have plenty of stories that can fit into this subreddit. This encounter will always stick out because it was probably the only time I was in any real danger. Our pub has a lot of patrons that are from out of town. They are always asking me what other places I would recommend. I used to always include my favorite late night bar until this incident happened. An attractive man came in, probably in his late twenties early thirties, he sat at one of my tables and I was actually in a dorky way kind of excited to wait on him because of his physical appearance. He asks me what beer I suggest that he drink so I tell him to get my favorite beer. He orders it and enjoys it, then he orders a second round. We really weren't happening that night so he asked me if there were any other bars around town that would have more going on. I then asked him where he was from and what he was doing in town. It ended up that we were from the same place, which was in a different state almost 10 hours away, so we kind of bonded over being from the same area. He also tells me he is a traveling medical supplies salesman, which I'm not entirely sure was real or not. I ended up suggesting a few bars around town and also included my favorite late night place and without thinking I would be there later with my co-workers. We talked a little more and he wasn't being creepy at all. He then pays his tab and says he is going to go check out some of the places I suggested. Hours later I got off work with my co-workers and all I could think about was getting a beer and relaxing. I had honestly forgotten about that dude. I walked into my favorite late night place and as soon as I walked in, that dude ran up to me and told me in an excited tone how he had been waiting for me all night. I thought that was strange and desperate but he was attractive and I'm a social butterfly so I just thought he was being friendly and wanted to meet some new people. I don't know, I really wasn't thinking. I walked off after greeting that dude and sat down at the bar with my co-workers who are both males. I also know pretty much everyone at that bar so I never really get freaked out. I also have confidence that someone has my back and is watching out for me. That dude came and stood next to me and that's when things got beyond weird. I realized pretty quickly he was beyond messed up. It seemed like on top of drinking he had taken some pills or some kind of drug. I kinda just ignore him for the most part but then he starts aggressively trying to hold me, kiss me, and really touch me in any kind of way. Which is making me super uncomfortable. I had to pee so I told my coworker to watch my beer while I went to the bathroom. I come out and while I'm finishing my beer that dude keeps getting more and more creepy. Just very touchy and saying how perfect I was and really just your typical creepy talk. Also he keeps trying to get me to come to his hotel room with him. I mentioned to my co-workers that I feel uncomfortable and if they could help me out that'd be nice but they think it's funny and really pay no attention to the situation. After having enough of his creepy advances I decide I cannot enjoy myself and it's time for me to go home. So I ninja dipped after finishing off my beer. I acted like I was going to the bathroom and would be right back but I just walked to my car. I was not drunk there is no way I could have been after one 12 ounce beer. I wouldn't have driven if I had been drunk. I don't drink and drive. I live around 40 minutes from my job and my favorite bar. I was very confident I could make it home. Seriously, one beer is nothing. I was very very wrong. All I remember is excitement and then I woke up and my car was flipped over in a ditch. I totaled my car. Luckily I didn't hit anyone else and I was okay. My mom came and picked me up before anyone called the cops which I'm very thankful for because I'm sure they would have accused me of driving while under the influence. My mom still to this day does accuse me of drinking under the influence even after telling her about that creep. I really think he slipped something in my beer and I'm so lucky I didn't get hurt or hurt anyone else. I have only told my mom and a few close friends this story but no one believes me, they all think I just drank a lot that night and drove and wanted to hide the fact I was drinking and driving. Which I would never ever do. The cherry on this creepy pie is a few days after all this went down that creepy dude sent me a friend request on Facebook, which is so strange because I don't use my real name on Facebook and have no personal information on it, so I have no idea how he found my Facebook page. 
I felt so sick to my stomach when I saw that friend request. I blocked his page and it's been about a year and I haven't heard or seen anything about him. Creepy traveling medical supplies dude, let's not meet again, ever. So I'm currently a sophomore in college and the bar scene here is pretty big. Going out for the night to get special deals on alcohol so you can get plastered with your friends is kind of the go-to here. Despite this, I'm not a huge drinker and don't enjoy it a lot because it tastes so bad and hurts my stomach. I do enjoy the company though and often go just to be out with my friends or meet new people. A lot of times I'm called the dad of the group because I end up taking care of them all the time. That's the prelude to what happened when I decided to go with them one Friday night. So we got all dressed up, pre-gaming a bit at my friend Q's apartment before we Ubered downtown to one of our pretty well-known college bars slash clubs. After we got in my friends immediately split off into tiny groups combing over the club for girls they wanted to try their shot at spending the night with. This is going to make me sound weird, but one night stands aren't really my thing and I don't want to end up cock blocking my friends so instead of looking for girls I usually find someone at the bar and make friends with them. I was chatting with some dude that was wearing a cowboy hat when eventually a girl approached me. She was pretty cute, probably five, six with dirty blonde hair and eyes that I think were light brown, but they were so light they almost looked gold which threw me off a bit. She asked if she could buy me some drinks in exchange for being her friend for the night, and I of course accepted, because hey, that's what I came here for anyway right? Anyway she kept her word and we started talking to each other and she introduced herself as Alexia, but to call her Alex. I asked her some basic stuff about if she came with friends, if she went to college here, etc. to which all the answers were no. That struck me as pretty odd as it's honestly pretty unsafe to be in the downtown area alone as a girl at like 1am in the morning. She said she wanted to hear about me though and actually seemed pretty excited to listen. It felt like a really nice change of pace because I'm usually the one learning about other people, not the other way around. It also could have been the alcohol starting to take effect since I'm actually a pretty big lightweight as like I said I don't actually binge drink often. The whole time I was talking, she stared into my eyes and had this warm smile that made me feel so acknowledged, if that even makes sense. I felt like she was enjoying her time as much as I was and that just made me even happier because I thought it meant I made a new friend. That was when her demeanor began to change though. She started to get kind of flirty and eventually asked if I wanted to go home with her. Like I said I'm not really a one night stand guy, and I explained I like to get to know people a little better before sleeping together. I'm pretty sure I saw what I think was anger flash across her face, but it was quickly replaced with another smile and she suggested just going home and watching a movie instead. I agreed and pulled out my phone to begin ordering an Uber, but she basically grabbed my wrist and started guiding me outside. I was confused, trying to ask if she was planning to drive after drinking but she wouldn't really answer me. We eventually got outside the club, and she pointed to a black Honda Civic parked right at the front of the club. That was when all the warning bells rang like a tornado had passed through them. I was pretty drunk at this point in the night, maybe six or seven drinks deep, but I was still aware enough to see the red flags. She said she had come alone, but the lane the car was parked in was only for pickups, and I never saw her order an Uber. Somebody would have had to be driving the car. This was enough to make me uncomfortable and I asked again if she was planning to drive the car. She said yes as she continued walking me closer to it. I knew that was a bald-faced lie, and as we got closer my heart sank as I noticed the outline of three other guys in the car. At that point, my adrenaline kicked in, and I yanked my hand away from her and said there's no way in hell I'm getting in that car with her. She tried begging me one more time, saying she really wanted to have sex and would let me do whatever I wanted, but I already had turned around to walk back to the club. She started cussing me out, practically screaming at the top of her lungs as I walked back up to the bouncers to go in. I texted my friends what happened and we all met back up and went home. It was obvious she was going to college bars, trying to get guys drunk before offering to sleep with them, so she could get them in that car with three other men to rob them or do god knows what else. 
I called my city's anonymous tip line and left a detailed description of the girl, car, and place where it happened. That night was a real wake-up call for me, and I'm so thankful that despite being drunk that night I was able to piece together what was happening before it was too late. Please remember to always be safe when going out with friends, especially when it's late at night or if alcohol is involved. But to Alexia, who I saw that night at the bar, let's not meet. Okay before you read just know that I know what my friend and I did in this story was stupid and irresponsible. I am well aware of what can happen to people when they don't think about consequences before acting. Anywho, my friend Dee and I were out one night at a club. She had driven but at some point had become far too drunk to drive home. She had run into an old friend at the bar and he bought her a few too many shots. I took note of this and cut off my drinking fairly early, so that I could be the DD. We stay at the club until close and as we are standing outside and Dee is having a cigarette, we are approached by a car with two guys in it. They looked nice enough around our age. They asked us if we wanted to go to the after hours bar down the street. Before I can say no, Dee jumps in the car and says, yes please let's go. She is not normally the type of person to do something like this, like at all. I think she was just really drunk and didn't want the night to end. So we are driving with these two strange guys and they take us a few blocks up the street. They park in a residential neighborhood and tell us that we absolutely have to stop talking from this point on. We approach a house and I already feel uneasy. The after hours bar was behind what appeared to be a normal house door. There was a double door situation with a bouncer in between, checking IDs and membership cards. The bouncer allowed us all to come in even though only one of them had a membership. He said something on a walkie like, two girls, and I remember thinking that he was only letting us in because we were girls. Once inside we took note of how odd the place was. There was no music playing and a lot of people talking. It was a very long place, with a door at the back and the door we came through being the only exits. The guys go to the bar and Dee tells me she has to go to the bathroom. They tell us where to go. We find a staircase into a basement, a huge basement with a long hallway, surrounded by a chain-link fence and construction cones and such. At the end of the hallway we see the creepiest bathroom I have ever encountered. We talked about how scary the place was and how we just wanted to leave. Dee had a bad feeling about it and so did I. We decided we would just head out ASAP when we went back upstairs. We get back upstairs and Dee heads straight towards the front door that we came in at. She goes to push on it and the bouncer in between pushes back and tells her we cannot exit that way. She freaks out. I calm her down and tell her it's okay, we can just go out the other door on the other side of the bar. As we turn to go to the other end of the long room I notice that we are literally the only girls there, and we were not the only ones who noticed that. We began to get approached by some of the guys as we passed. We kind of just blew them off when the original two guys we came with stopped us and asked us where we were going. We told them we wanted to leave and headed for the back door before they could protest. We got to the door, which had an exit sign above it. I pushed on it first. It wouldn't budge. Then D tried as well. Would not open. We noticed there is a huge bar in front of it and we are unable to push it so that it will open. At this point one of the men at the bar approaches us and says, where do you girls think you're going? I know that he probably meant it jokingly, but at the time we were terrified and felt trapped. We told him that we were just trying to leave, at this point D was crying because she was probably certain in her drunk brain that we were going to die. I tried to remain calm and explain to him that we tried going out the front exit and we were not allowed. He told us that the front was the only way out, and the back exit was locked. I looked at D, and told her that I didn't give a shit what that bouncer said that he had to let us out the door. Luckily, I am a fairly tall person, and while I am not very big or muscular, I probably look stronger than my 90 pounds 5 feet 0 inches friend. We head back again past the guys and the bar, and a lot of people are trying to talk to us and we get back to the front door. 
I push on it and tell the guy he has to let us out that we need to go. He sees my friend and immediately apologizes for not letting us out earlier. He said that he couldn't because he had people coming in. I told him that it was fucked up that the door in the back was locked and that their bathrooms were creepy as fuck and with that me and her were off into the night. He asked us not to talk on the street, which we didn't but we ran to the main road and started cracking up laughing at how we were just 100% certain we were going to be raped and murdered by like 50 guys. Dee knew the area fairly well and even though she was too drunk to walk completely straight, we made it back to her car about a half hour later. We got approached by another guy in a car on the way back asking if we wanted a ride, luckily this time we said fuck no and he was on his way. In 2006, I was a college student at Arizona State University. I lived in an off-campus apartment, on the ground floor, and it was a block off a major street here in Phoenix called Baseline. These details are important. In the summer of 2006, Phoenix, Arizona was plagued by two serial killers. One was the Phoenix Shooter, who ended up being a team of two guys randomly shooting people, and the other was the Baseline Killer a rapist and murderer. Having two serial killers put the entire city on edge, and everyone was talking about it. I even saw articles in Time or Newsweek about the situation. So, the fall 2006 semester had just started. Now, you may have heard this, but Phoenix is hot in August. It would get stuffy in my apartment, and so I'd leave the window cracked a little because the morning air is nice. The blinds provided visual cover. Anyways, one morning, a strange sound woke me up. It was the crack of dawn for colon 45 am, and the sun was just barely coming up. It was the sound of someone lightly tapping on the window, and it seemed intentional. In my tired state, I figured it could be a bird or some branches or something trivial. Tap tap tap, silence. After about 90 seconds of nothing, the tapping returned, and it was absolutely purposeful. I was positive it was a human producing this noise. I thought it was my boyfriend, who thought it was cute to try and scare me sometimes. I decided I'd be a bit of a brat and make him wait, but I was also getting really angry. How dare he pull a prank when I'm trying to sleep? This is just like him. I'm going to give him a piece of my mind about disturbing my sleep like this. Tap tap tap. At a certain point, I got up to get a glass of water, still being in the mindset of wanting to annoy my stupid boyfriend who thought this would be funny. But I saw some movement through the slit in the blinds, and I marched over and yanked the blinds so I could see. Definitely. Not. My. Boyfriend. I said very loudly, what the f-u-c-k. He sort of seemed taken back by my anger, but only slightly. The man I saw will be with me forever, or more specifically, his eyes and the feeling they gave me were insanely, creepy. Honestly, words can't do justice to how terrifying his eyes were. They looked like black orbs with no white in them. Absolutely predatory. When I see pictures of Ted Bundy or Charles Manson, that's exactly what he looked like. Even if you saw a picture of how they looked, it's different when you experience it in person. It totally floored me something about this man was profoundly wrong. He was crouched down, like an umpire. He had on dark pants, a dark purple shirt, and a dark Nike hat. He had dark skin I thought he was Hispanic, but later I found out he was a light-skinned black guy, you'll find out how I learned his name later. Anyways, after I yelled, what the f-u-c-k, at him, he whispers to me, can I talk to you? If you want to know how insanely creepy that is to hear, just whisper that sentence out loud to yourself right now. It still sends chills down my spine when I think of how that sounded. His hand subtly moved towards his waist. I later learned he would blitz attack his victims and he probably had a gun. All that separated us was a mesh screen. Now, this is about a three second interaction at this point. For some reason, I thought of Ted Bundy and how he'd pretend to be crippled to target his victims. I thought of my mom telling me to not be nice to strangers don't be afraid to be a bitch. 
My thinking wasn't as calculated as all that, but it was more the nanoprocessing of how to deal with the situation. So, when he whispered that, I started yelling at him, hell no, get the F-U-C-K out of here douchebag. I shut the window angrily and locked it. I can't overemphasize how incredibly irritated I was that this person had the audacity to disturb my precious sleep. I laid back down and wondered if I'd been too mean. What if he needed help? But that didn't really make sense. Why would he be, like, tapping and whispering if he was truly in trouble? I decided he was a creep after all. I was too annoyed to go back to sleep, but I sort of laid back down. I told my roommate about an hour later and she sort of jokingly asked if it could have been the baseline killer. When she said that, my heart sank. His face looked exactly like it did in the police sketches that were on billboards everywhere. The only problem is that those billboards showed him with dreads, and the man at my window had no dreads. Apparently, he was some sort of disguise artist who'd wear wigs, updating the police sketch would have been a nice move, but they didn't. I called the Phoenix police, and the detective I talked to agreed that it sounded like his M.O. The suspect would say something to throw off his target, and then he'd blitz attack. The detective said that my angry response probably made me seem like too much of a hassle and moved on. The only problem was that I thought the guy looked Hispanic, and the detective said many witnesses described him as black. I thought they might want to come out and try for samples or surveillance video or something but I didn't hear back from the detective. My parents freaked out. Then got us knives, pepper spray, and put up signs. Edit, some PPL asked why I didn't get a gun. I can't remember why I didn't at the time, but I remember it being something I was open to when my dad brought it up. We learned another tenant had complained that same morning. I never learned the details, but this idiot was apparently going around the damn complex trying to find a target. The stupid apartment wouldn't let us out of our lease, so we moved to a second floor apartment right above our old unit. Side note, the neighbors who moved into our old unit were horrible. Obnoxious tweakers who would do meth and play pitbull on repeat for hours and have knife fights at 11am on weekdays. There were times I wondered if they might be worse than the actual serial killer who came to my window. So, that unit was cursed somehow. Anyways, on September 4, 2006, they arrested Mark Gudo. I think the detective didn't call me back because they were days away from arresting Gudo. When I saw his mugshot, I was sick but also relieved. He was absolutely the guy outside my window. To me, he looked like he could be Hispanic. You can judge for yourself if you Google it. He's on death row in Arizona now. His wife tried to mount some campaign to show that the police were framing him or something. On a personal level, it certainly would make for an interesting coincidence if this poor innocent man who they framed was also whispering like a creep and tapping my window. I can't think of something more scary than a serial killer tapping on your window. That actually happened to me, and if it happens to you, just scare them right back. Don't be afraid to be downright rude to someone who's injecting themselves into your space. It could save your life if you're not afraid to throw your weight around and tell someone off. Trust yourself. You can still be a kind and generous person and still tell someone to fuck off. One time I went to the bar with one of my friends. I had just turned 21 so I hadn't been to many bars up to that point. My friend was drinking on the way to the bar so he was already pretty drunk when we got there. When I sat at the bar a cute girl came and talked to me and my friend. She said her name was Candace and I noticed she had really really bright red hair. I assumed she dyed it. It was pretty, but unnatural. Anyways. This girl was flirting with me and my friend. She could tell my friend was already very drunk. To be honest I played along like I was drunk already too since it seemed to be working for my friend. I didn't know if she was just trying to get free drinks so I told her we didn't have much money. She offered to buy us drinks. She kept buying us drinks and I started to get confused as to who she liked between me and my friend. My friend went to the bathroom. 
before he came back he was kicked out by the bouncers. He was too drunk. Candace and I went outside with him. She kept telling him to go home with her. He was so out of it he could barely answer her. I told her he was too drunk and that I couldn't let him go anywhere. I didn't want him to wake up hungover in some random house with no car and no idea what happened. Candace kept pushing it, saying that she would take care of him but I told her no because I had to stay with him, I was more sober than him, he was my responsibility. I told her the only way he was going anywhere was if I tagged along. I assumed she thought that I was jealous or cock blocking but my friend could barely stand and lost interest in Candace already at that point. She immediately started flirting with me and offered to get my friend a taxi to drive him home and said we could go to her place alone. At this point I had a few drinks and I was pretty buzzed so I agreed. We took my friend to the taxi and walked to her car. I slightly stumbled on the way to her car. Wow you're pretty drunk huh? She said smiling as she held onto my arm, yeah, I said. I don't know why but I just felt slightly shy and anxious. Everything was just happening too easy for me so I felt uneasy. We got in her car we drove down the street. Wanna stop at the liquor store and get some more to drink? I'll buy it so don't worry about paying, she offered. I didn't want to drink any more than I already did. I was already buzzed and wanted to be able to carry myself throughout the rest of the night. Sometimes I made myself look stupid when I'm drunk so I didn't want to ruin anything with Candace more than I already did earlier with telling her my friend was too drunk. I told her I was already drunk enough but she insisted. I didn't want to seem lame so I told her to get me a pint of liquor with some apple juice to chase it. She went in the store and came out with a lot more than just a pint. I assumed she wanted to drink more also and that's why she got a fifth instead of a pint. On the car ride we passed the bottle back and forth but she took tiny sips. I tried to take tiny sips but she kept passing me the bottle and telling me to drink. I somehow managed to drink all of my apple juice and pretend to drink the bottle by spitting the liquor in the apple juice bottle. I tossed the apple juice bottle full of liquor out the window before she saw it. I didn't want her to know I was acting drunker than I was. She actually believed I was sloppy drunk when I was simply buzzed. I took a couple more sips of liquor and finished the bottle. Throughout the car ride I called her the wrong name a couple of times to get a reaction out of her. She didn't react to it. She just kept letting me call her Carla without correcting me. For some reason I thought she lied to me about her name initially. We drove up to her house. I pretended to trip and stumbled into her front door. She helped me walk inside by holding me up. She opened her front door, which was unlocked. We walked in her house, she closed her front door and then locked it. I thought that was strange but assumed she didn't want anyone walking in on us. I told her that I had to use the bathroom. I walked into her bathroom, locked the door and looked in the mirror. I just felt strange, I felt like something was off. I felt myself becoming more drunk from finishing the bottle earlier. I turned on the sink to make noise and made myself puke up the liquor I drank. I flushed and went to the sink and started drinking the tap water out of my hands to sober up. I just didn't want to be drunk but I still wanted to hook up with Candace so I wanted to pretend to be drunk. I turned the sink off and I could hear her talking to someone, he's drunk as hell. He can barely stand up. You do it. Who was she talking to? And do what? I walked out of the bathroom and into the living room. The moment I stepped into the living room I saw her walking into another room. All I could see was the back of her head that strange very bright red hair go into another room. I didn't see her face or anything. I just saw her kind of walk fast into the room. The living room was pretty dark. Hey where you going? I slurred like I was drunk. She walked back into the dark living room and up to me, let's go in my room, she said. I looked at her bright red hair and then into her eyes. They were different. Her face was different. It was another girl with the same hair. That's when I realized. It was another girl with the same wig on. 
It was a wig the whole time. She had changed it with the girl from earlier for whatever reason. My heart felt like it stopped. But I tried to look like I had no idea it was a different girl. I kind of smiled at her and told her I just needed to use the bathroom one more time and told her sorry I was so drunk. She said, it's fine just hurry up in there, I went into the bathroom and locked the door. I heard her whisper something to someone again this time I think I heard a male voice whisper back. I honestly didn't concentrate on listening to exactly what she said, something sketchy was going on and I had to get out of that house. I opened the bathroom window and jumped straight out of it and ran faster than I have ever ran in my life. I didn't look behind myself or anything. I just ran through the backyard, jumped the fence, ran through someone else's backyard, hit a road, and ran toward the main road. I kept running down the main road until I saw a 24-hour convenience store. I ran into the store and stood straight at the front of the store in front of the camera. I called a taxi and went home. I try to think about what happened that night. What was she, or they, planning that night? Why did she tell me a fake name? Why was she trying to get my friend and I so drunk? I thought maybe it was a robbery but she kept spending money on us. She kept buying us drinks and even paid for my friend's taxi cab. And mostly, why did she wear a wig that she gave to another girl to wear? Who was she talking to? What did it mean? And what was in that room they tried to lure me into? Edit, the next day after this incident I went back to the house with a couple of friends to see just what was going on. Nobody was there. No cars, no people, nothing. Just an empty house. I ended up finding out that the house was a summer rental and whoever those people were, they broke into that house and used it for only that night and never came back. It was the summer of 2016 and I had just married my long-time girlfriend. Over the course of our 12-year relationship we had traveled to the mountains several times in both summer and winter for camping but also to stay in nice mountain hotels and snowboard the slopes. Naturally, we both agreed this was how we wanted to spend the first few weeks of our marriage. We booked a 20-day stay at a mountainside campground on the other side of the country. We also decided to bring our dogs with us as they too love being outdoors and we generally bring them camping anyway. After two days of road tripping we had arrived, quickly set up and settled in for a good long stay on the mountain. It was beautiful. A couple of days into our trip and we had already met a bunch of fellow campers. We are very experienced campers so we generally attract a lot of attention from novice campers asking for tools or supplies as they see we are well set up. We are usually more than happy to help people get situated if they need matches, cream or sugar, or help setting up their equipment. It was day four or five when she first made her presence known to us. I will refer to this person as she or her as we never learned her name. We were sitting down under the shade of the large pine tree at the edge of our site, drinking beers and playing cards when she seemingly appeared out of nowhere. She was just suddenly right there. Can I pet your dog, she said. Even my dogs didn't see her approach as the very sound of her voice triggered them into a startled frenzy. As the dogs were worked up already, I politely told her no. Then she just stood there, at the edge of our sight. Didn't say a word. Just stood there sort of existing but not really doing anything. She wasn't exactly staring at us or looking at anything in particular. I asked her if she needed anything and she said no. After a few minutes she walked off. I work with people with brain injuries so I've had my fair share of experiences with unusual behaviors including people with poor social skills so I wasn't about to write this person off as creepy just yet, but she had my attention. I casually watched her walk off and enter a campsite across the path and a few sites down from ours. There was already a small tent set up in the site but she proceeded to pull an even smaller single-person tent from her backpack and began setting it up. The day prior we saw two young girls set up the other tent and were clearly the occupants of the site. There was no further interaction with her that day although we did notice that the owners of the other tent on the site were not around at all that day and we didn't see them return that night. Well, 
the next morning I am walking to the camp showers to clean up for the day. As I walk past her site, I see she is sitting in her little tent reading a book. The door to the tent is open. I pay no attention and keep on my way to take my shower. When I'm done my shower and walking back I notice her tent is now closed but it's jiggling about so I know someone is in there. Then she made her presence known in a big way. Just as I am approaching her site on the way to mine, she unzips her tent and I immediately see that she is completely nude. She then positions herself just inside the tent at the door and lets out this over-the-top full body stretch and holds her arms way up the sky while pushing her chest forward like it was some kind of mating ritual designed just for me. While she does this she lets out what I only describe as an exotic moan. It was pretty obvious she was putting on a show for me. I continue on my way to my site and tell my wife about the display I had just witnessed too. We both laughed it off and moved on with our plans today hike a good trail to a waterfall. The trailhead for this hike was accessible from the campground so we didn't have to drive to get there. We just walked the additional 2 kilometers to the trail. We walked at a good pace so when we got to the trail we decided to stop for a few minutes and take some photos of the surrounding mountains before heading into the thicker bush. After sitting there for maybe five minutes while my wife is taking pictures, she emerges from the trail that leads towards the campground. At first I thought, okay coincidence, she's staying here and this is a pretty common trail. But then she sees that I see her and she stops dead in her tracks and just stands there. Same demeanor as our first encounter. Just standing, not doing anything in particular but also sending creep vibes our way. This was the first time I said to my wife, I think we have a stalker. Confused, my wife then looks to where I'm looking and is immediately a little creeped out. Once again I think, whatever, maybe she's just hiking the trail no big deal. So we continue on the trail at a good pace and she maintains a consistent distance behind us. Our dogs at this point are a little distracted by her and our youngest dog keeps turning around to watch her. I got a little fed up with the dog constantly stopping to look back so I decided we will stop for some water and let this woman pass. Well what does she do, but fucking stop walking when we stop and once again just stands there. Okay so now we are genuinely concerned because this is approaching horror slash suspense movie creep level and I start to wonder what this girl's intentions are. Standing motionless at that distance and refusing to pass us just ramped up the oh shit factor to about 9. So my wife and I agreed to just give up and cut the hike short by taking the shorter loop which was only another half kilometer ahead, and head back to our camp. We managed to get some distance between us by jogging every time we would make a turn and she was out of sight. We didn't see her again until later that night. That night my wife decided to take an evening shower at the camp showers. When she returned to our camp she told me our stalker was in the bathrooms also taking a shower. This time however she was with two other girls and appeared to be getting ready for a night at the club. There is a nearby ski town that has a few nightclubs and bars so it was reasonable to see the girls getting ready for a night out. The two girls she was with were the two we saw previously set up at her site. My wife explains that she quickly picked up on the fact that the two girls and our stalker friend were not well known to each other. It was clear that the two girls were close friends with plans to go out partying, and our stalker was making an attempt to be friends and sort of invited herself to join them in their night out. Now we know the ski town well, and the girls kept reinforcing that they were meeting at a specific restaurant before going to the bar. It was currently 10.30 p.m. and we know the restaurant they were telling her to go to was closed at 10 p.m. They were lying to her about their plans. The stalker kept asking them too, are you sure this place, are you sure? They convinced her, and she then left to her tent to finish getting ready while the two friends stayed in the bathroom to finish their makeup. My wife went on to explain how after, she left the two friends were mocking and making fun of our stalker. They were young twenty-somethings acting like little girls in elementary school. My wife has no time for that, creepy stalker or not she had to say something to the girls for their behavior. My wife calls them out on their behavior. Well, putting all the caddy bitch bullying aside, the girls explained to my wife that the stalker girl had set up her tent on their site when they were staying with a friend in the ski town. 
When they returned they found her living at their site without invitation. She had just taken it upon herself to take a little corner of their site without knowing them at all. The girls said they were upset with her and trying to make her feel uncomfortable so she would leave, but she wouldn't leave. Of course my wife asked them why they didn't just report her to the park warden. The excuse they gave was they were leaving the next day and didn't want to make a huge deal out of it. So whatever happened between them and the fake late dinner plans and clubbing is unknown to us. About 3 a.m. that same night we were all awoken to a blood-curdling scream right outside our camper. At first I was like, holy shit that must be a wild animal. My wife is trembling, dogs barking, and I am startled but curious. I peel back the window cover to see her, standing motionless on the path outside our trailer. I had the window cover down maybe 8 to 10 centimeters when she appeared to make direct eye contact with me. My heart rate is jacked. What the actual fuck? After gazing in my general direction for what seemed like an eternity, she calmly turns around and walks to her tent. I will make sure our trailer is locked. After a good hour, and a stiff whiskey we manage to get back to sleep. So the next day is Friday. We have friends from a nearby major city coming up the mountains to spend the weekend with us. We haven't seen them in a while so we are excited for a couple days together. Well they are not at our site for 15 minutes, and as they are setting up their tent, she mysteriously appears out of nowhere yet again. Like Bam there she is, but now this time she is actually on our site. I hadn't had a chance to tell our friends about her before she arrived so they were a little more friendly than I was. She asks me once again if she can pet my dog, who during all of this is barking at her. I think I said something like, she isn't being very friendly towards you right now so I would prefer if you didn't. She didn't pet my dog but she also just stood there staring at me like she was considering how she would dismember my limbs. She then notices our friend's tent brand as he is still setting it up and comments on how it's the same model as hers although a larger sleeping capacity. My buddy has picked up on the creep vibes and my general displeasure with her presence so just gives her the, oh you cool, and keeps setting it up. Well she starts grabbing at the tent pegs and picks up the hammer and says she will help him set it up cause she has experience with it. My buddy declines and asks for his tools back. Cue the fucking psychopath stare down but this time she has a hammer in hand, adding Well this is my story I experienced with my friend at a laundromat I go to every week. Sorry for the length. Let me give you some background information that is necessary. I'm 17 and female, Caucasian. I work with my mom at a local newspaper business. She happens to be one of the four bosses. So, needless to say, in this part of town everyone knows my mom and I. We work in the delivery part. We go in at 12 a.m. to start delivering. After I'm done I head back to our home and pack up our laundry, we are AA family of seven, so we have seven baskets worth of clothes. The laundry mat I go to is also a gas station and is across the street from our workplace. The cashier and my mother are best friends so she agreed to keep an eye on me while I washed clothes. Well this weekend I brought my friend with me to work and do laundry to get done faster to study for finals that coming Monday. We had already bought the clothes in and started washing. We have been there about an hour already and it's about 4 a.m. in the morning at this point in time. The clothes had already been put in the dryer so I left about three quarters on a table next to the dryers just in case one of them needed more time. We happened to be one only ones there so I didn't think twice about leaving them sitting there. So Lacey and I stood at another table, being 17-year-olds, laughing and dicking around. When all of a sudden I see this old man with ragged clothes and a book bag stumble in. So therefore I knew he wasn't there to wash his clothes due to his book bag and lack of a laundry basket or bag. He walked straight over to the quarters on the table and picked them up and slipped them into his pocket. He looked up and noticed we were watching him. He said, this y'all's change be in, right here. Yes this is what he said, grammar and all. I reply, yes it is. He pulled it out of his pocket and looked down at his old, wrinkled hand and said, oh, with sadness in his eyes. 
Then I grabbed my hand and dropped them in it. I felt bad for the old man so I said, no 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 you keep it, his head snapped up and snatched it from my hand quicker than I had realized and said, no I couldn't take it from you two beautiful, fine young ladies. But if you have a little more, I would appreciate it, I started to think to myself about what the hell is wrong with him and if he didn't realize he just took money from me even after rejecting it. He thanked us for being so polite to him and babbled about not doing drugs and how Lacey and I were bright beautiful young women and how we still had the sunshine in our eyes, then he proceeded to call us hot, attractive, and beautiful. But crossed the line when he said that he was 55 physically but 18 at heart if we knew what he meant. Then at one point he said I would look good pregnant or with a baby. That was it I had had enough I excused myself and walked in the gas station. I felt bad for leaving my friend with him but I had to get help. So I practically ran in there and got Amanda, the cashier that I described him to her and she said that he was banned from the property for beating his ex-wife in the parking lot about a few months back. She came storming in the room and when he saw her coming he hauled ass out of there. Well apparently he walked across the street to my work and started harassing my mom and asked her for a job application. He then asked for money and if he could sleep in her office. My mom politely refused and asked him to leave. That's when shit got real. He started yelling and getting up in my mom's face saying that she was an inconsiderate bitch and he would kill her. If you knew my mom, you would know she didn't put up with that shit and kicked him out and called the cops. After college, I had a low-paying job for a while, so I lived in a rough neighborhood. One sunny Saturday afternoon, I'm at the crowded laundromat. Since I brought all of my linens and comforter in addition to the usual amount of clothes, several hours have passed. By now, the sun is going down, and one by one people are finishing up and leaving until it's just me. It's now full dark outside and still about 40 minutes until my comforter will be dry when a huge man walks in. Even though I'm above average height for a woman, this guy is easily 6 inches taller than I am. And you guessed it he doesn't have any laundry with him. The hair immediately stands up on the back of my neck. I square up my shoulders to my full height and look at him with my best attempt at bitch face, with the idea to convey something like, hey man, I will pick you out of a lineup. He must have taken this as some kind of invitation because he starts saying really crass things while laughing and smiling and asking if I have a boyfriend. When I don't reply, he starts walking around the island of washers in the middle of the room to get to me, at the same time I'm walking around the other way so we are no closer to each other. Unfortunately, this puts me at the back of the place out of view of any windows and him close to the door. He flashes a big grin, and then locks the door. At this point I'm plotting what to do next. My keys are in my pocket. I can put keys between my fingers to try to use as a weapon or I can have my car key ready to unlock the door as fast as possible to get away. I decide to try and run for it since he has a major size advantage and would probably overpower me anyway, with my backup plan to cause as much damage to him as possible if he gets me anyway, visualizing myself ripping out an eye, biting a chunk out of anything I can reach. All of a sudden he runs at the center of the island of washers and vaults over it to try and grab me. I am in full flight mode now. I swear I could feel my adrenal glands rocket out the adrenaline blast that must have had me set a land speed record. Somehow in what felt like a millisecond, I'm at the door to the laundromat, lock unlocked, out the door, at my car driver's side, car door unlock, inside car, ignition on. But he is there too, grabbing at my arm as I'm flooring it, peeling out, tires squealing, like a maniac with him still holding on to the door after losing grip on my arm. With my car door wide open still, but getting away, he is pounding on my trunk until I'm far ahead. In my rear view I see him still running after my car. This is pre-cell phones. I drive to my friend's house, probably blowing through stop signs, I can't really remember the drive, bang on the door, and she lets me in. I tell her what happened, we call the police, and I file an incident report. The police and my friend and I go to the laundromat and I collect my stuff and finally I go home. 
It turns out the guy had a warrant out for his arrest for aggravated assault and some drug charges. I never saw him again, and I hope no one else has either. At the end of my junior year spring semester, I moved into a townhouse which I shared with my roommate of two years, and a bats hit crazy landlady, but that's a story for another day. The washer slash dryer at the new place was broken, so I decided to go to a local laundromat after class to wash my work clothes and a couple shirts I'd stolen from my boyfriend. I had classes in the evening, so this was around 9pm at the absolute earliest, and I had to take the bus to get there. A tall man, who looked to be anywhere in his thirties or forties, approached me as I was waiting for my laundry load to finish. His looks were average but pleasant, and he had a smooth voice, yet something about him immediately set me on edge. He sat down on the bench beside me, and started chatting me up even though I had headphones in. I am really accustomed to being approached by strangers, whether they are asking directions, randomly telling me their life story, or being creepy. This was naturally a case of the latter, but even for a stranger hitting on me, he was giving me really weird vibes. He asked if I lived in the apartments across the street, and if I had family in the area. He asked if I was new in town, which made no sense to me as I live in a massive suburban city of DC, so why would anyone recognize anyone? He kept interjecting to say how cute and adorable I was, and asked my age, guessing that I was 18 to 19. I was 21 at the time, but people often think I'm in high school even now. The fact that he was hitting on me while thinking I was still a barely legal teen made it that much creepier. I didn't tell him where I lived or where I was from, and said I was getting a load of laundry done for my boyfriend real quick. I lied and said that I lived with him, my partners and I don't cohabitate, and that he'd be expecting me home soon. The man then proceeded to say that we could still be friends and offered to take me out or invite me in for dinner. The way he smiled when he said it freaked me out. By now it had to be about 10 o'clock and I was super creeped out so I firmly said no thank you and tried to put my headphones back in as obviously as possible. He got up and disappeared for a while. Then, as I transferred my laundry to the dryer, he reappeared and started pacing around the small laundromat, intentionally coming up close behind me. The dryers were located on the back wall of the room, so this made me feel like I was being effectively cut off from the exit. He was strongly built and about 6 foot 3, so he utterly dwarfed me by comparison. I'm only 5 feet 4 inches, and had been on a break from the gym for most of the semester, so my muscles were rather lacking. As I kept an eye on his reflection, I found myself thinking of every possible route out, and trying to recall the self-defense classes I'd taken back in January until the dryer finished. By the time I was done he had left. Something in my gut told me not to exit through the main front door, and when I went out through the side entrance, I saw him sitting directly in front of the main exit with his driver's side door open, and his phone out, as if he was waiting for someone. I called a friend and booked it to a nearby restaurant where I hid out for at least another hour. I occasionally peeked out of the window to see if he'd moved, but he remained there for another 30 minutes. No one ever came to meet him, and a sick feeling in my stomach confirmed my fear that it was me whom he was waiting for. I ordered some Korean fried chicken and called an Uber home. I'm used to having creepy experiences with men, on the metro or when I'm walking down the street. But this felt different than the usual catcalls and following. My body was on high alert and I was so fucking afraid, and embarrassed that I'd even gotten myself into that position in the first place. When I got home, I just burst into tears. I never told my boyfriend or my girlfriend about it, and it was months before I ever told my roommate. I recently read a Twitter thread about a girl who almost got trafficked by a guy while waiting for the subway, and was hit with the realization that my laundromat horror story could easily have been exactly that. At the time all I could think about was getting away, but now that it's been nearly a year I realize this could easily have been a trafficking attempt. I live in a very wealthy DC suburb because of where I go to school, but it is also statistically one of the highest sex trafficking areas in the country. The way he conducted himself was eerily similar to the other girl's description that I read, and I'm just really thankful that I didn't take that main door. 
I have no idea what might have happened to me if I had. To the creepy guy in Haley's laundromat, let's not meet. Ever. About me, I'm 20-year-old lesbian, short girl, and super beta. I like talking to people, but I'm too shy and awkward most of the time. Still, I'm always sure to smile when I make eye contact, or make a polite response if a stranger talks to me. I recently moved to Vermont, a lovely place with lovely people, many of whom seem to follow my shy but friendly attitude, and those who aren't shy are still mostly friendly. There's a little laundromat a block away from our new apartment, where I go each weekend. I don't work due to the anxiety, which I am working on, and since my partner provides the income, it's my job to do the chores. So while I'm off doing laundry, she's generally catching up on sleep. This particular day, I'd already loaded up my washer and was sitting, reading Reddit stories while I waited, when a little girl ran up to me. About five or six, and adorable. When I smiled at her, she giggled and ran off, then showed up again, peeking around one of the machines. This continued a few times, until her father appeared. I was caught by his massive unibrow, but again, politely smiled and went back to reading. Unfortunately, the man was having none of that, and while his daughter continued being cute, he tried to get me talking. He instantly had this creepy, perverted smile on his face, so it didn't take me long to realize I had no interest in the conversation. Being beta, I didn't want to be rude, but waited for my chance to make it clear I had zero interest. Him, so, where do you live around here? Wow, okay, getting right to the point. Me, oh, I live nearby. With my girlfriend. Again, bad at confrontation. I should mention he was of foreign origin, with a heavy accent, so the next part was maybe understandable. Him, oh, it's good you have a friend to keep you company. I quickly explained that no, she wasn't that kind of friend. I could see the gears working in his brain, and then he finally got it. I hoped that would be the end of it. Nope. Him, can I ask you a personal question? How does that work, with two women? The sex. Hindsight is a bitch. But I used to work at an LGBT community education program in Florida, and my training kicked in, plenty of people asked overly personal questions at the presentations, which was just part of the job. So I did my best to explain in a non-sexual way, using words like, emotional connection, and the sort. Him, but what about a baby? You can't have a baby. Me, well, I don't want a baby right now. And if I ever do, there are ways. He asks for clarification, and I briefly explain the test tube thing, still trying to steer the conversation away from sex. Him, but you can't have total satisfaction that way. I started texting my partner, who was still sleeping, because I was getting nervous but still too shy, and doing my best to think of the situation as funny. I tried to explain that having a baby wasn't about satisfaction, but he continued to use that same phrase, explaining that I could never have total satisfaction with a woman in bed. I moved my clothes to the dryer and returned to my seat in the corner. Two of his friends showed up, and he filled them in on the conversation. While I didn't notice it at the time, they had blocked me into the corner. The first man then started asking about where I lived again, trying to goad me into a specific answer, but all I'd say was, around. Suddenly the door slammed open and my partner came storming into the laundromat. She's just as feminine as I am, but she was groggy and pissed, and the death glare she was giving him made her look like the meanest bull dyke alive. She's also five inches taller than me, and is ex-navy. The man was suddenly very interested in his laundry. I pointed out that he could ask my girlfriend the same questions, and he quickly replied that he could ask her next time. She grabbed me and moved me away from the corner and blockade of men, and we stood and talked near my dryer until it had finished. On the walk home, I started filling her in on everything I couldn't text, until a car pulled up beside us. Guess who? Him, oh, do you live on this street? We did, in fact we were two houses away from ours. 
Now, my girl is awkward to the max, mildly autistic, hates talking to people, so all he got from her was more glares. Me, no, we live another street down. We kept walking, circling the block even when we didn't see his car, until we got back home. It was creepy, and I switched my laundry schedule to a different day, but apart from that nothing came of it. Family suggested we report it, but he didn't seem threatening to me, just creepy. That was over a month ago, and since then I haven't seen him. Until last night. It was around 10 p.m. Our neighborhood is generally very safe, and my dad and brother live two blocks away, so I often walk over late at night to spend time with them. I was just leaving the house when a car pulled up. Him, hello. Do you remember me? Oh fuck. At first I pretended not to recognize him, but when he continued trying to talk to me, I quickly remembered. Him, so, you live here? Me, no, no, just visiting a friend. Him, then where do you live? Me, um, around. Him, uh, you live nowhere. Me, yeah, nowhere. I laughed it off, and said I had to go, and he replied he'd see me later. I quickly made my way to my dad's, texting my partner as I went. She said she'd come pick me up in the car, and arrived with the closest thing to a weapon we had, my heavy kryptonite U-lock from my bike. When we got home, she put the lock next to our bed, and went running around the apartment trying to figure out how to make it somehow safer. At first I tried to tell her that it wasn't that big a deal, and that it was probably just a coincidence. But the fact that he kept pressuring me for my address the first time, and then continued this time, made it a little too creepy to ignore. Plus with my partner's military training, she's not about to just brush it off as, no big deal. I'm now forbidden from walking around at night, and while I assured her I'd get some mace or a taser, she says they're not good enough. She's been wanting a gun for ages, because she loves to go shooting, but now she wants one even more for protection. I'm still a bit shaken with the whole thing, and I'm still half expecting him to knock on the door any minute, as I said, my partner works all day, so Monday through Friday I'm alone in the house. I want to report him, if only to have something on file if it's needed, but I didn't have the foresight to get his plates, so the only information I have is, a super creepy guy with a unibrow who lives somewhere nearby. This happened about four years ago. My daughters, Addie and Alyssa, were nine and four years old, respectively. We, along with my husband, lived in a rented small two-bedroom house in a very small town. Unfortunately, both my washer and dryer broke within the same week and I was forced to go to the laundromat for a few months. And on this particular day, I decided to take our week's worth of laundry there while the girls were in school, instead of going after supper which was what I normally did. Once I arrived and hauled in the three big hampers, I realized I was the only person there. If you've ever had to use a laundromat, you could imagine the utter joy I felt, knowing I'd be in my very own company. No strangers to make small talk with, no awkward silences, and no waiting for machines. It practically never happens, so I was stoked. Anyway, I'd brought a book to read and time flew by in silence while my clothes washed. Once they were finished, I threw them all into dryers, still surprised and thankful nobody else had come in. With all the counter space I had, I folded all of my clothes into neat piles, each according to person. So, I had piles stacked for each daughter, then my husband, and myself. I was still waiting on one last load of clothes to dry when I heard the ding of the front door opening. I looked over and watched a slim man with a heavy jacket walk in and go straight towards the vending machine. He had no laundry with him. At first, I thought he was just coming in to buy a drink or snack, but it became evident that something wasn't right with this man. He was mumbling to himself in an Irish accent, words I couldn't make out but seemed to be angry in tone. He took off his jacket, only to turn around and put it back on. He did this several times, mumbling to himself the whole time. I'd make out words like, that girl, and, looking at me, so I thought he could be speaking about me. And, 
it made me very nervous. So, I grabbed my purse and phone and went out the front door to have a cigarette. I called my sister and told her about the man and his strange behavior. We both agreed he was either on some sort of drugs or had a mental illness. She offered to meet me at the place so I wasn't alone, but since my last load of clothes were likely dry by then, I told her I was going to pack up and leave. When I walked back into the laundromat, I breathed a sigh in relief when I saw that the man was no longer there. He must have walked out the back door. I quickly grabbed my clothes and started folding the last of them when I noticed something was off. There was a pile missing. My four-year-old's underwear pile had disappeared. I searched around for them, but they had vanished. That crazy man had stolen about ten pairs of my little girl's underpants. What kind of sicko was that? I ran outside, looking for him to chew him out, but he was long gone. I wanted to call the police on him, but I was due at the school in the next 15 minutes to pick up my kids and just didn't have time to fill out a report. It amazes me how disgusting some individuals are in this world. Crazy panty stealer from the laundromat, let's never meet again.